Hello again. I'm Luca Balzani from Odison. And I'm Ken Ward. And we are here for part two of our exploration of OEM integration. Today, our topic is from good to great. OEM improving made easy. Well, I'm going to say easier. I don't know if I can get us to easy. <laughs> OK. First, let me thank the hundreds of people that registered and attend the first episode of the webinars. 37 countries have connected from all over the world. And here are their flags. Let me thank USA and Canadian attendees that took the effort to stay with us during business hours. European, of course, but looking at the time zone, I would state the most heroic attendees were from Taiwan, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand. But the award goes to Australia, where the webinar started at 4 a.m. Now it's time to get back to work. Today we have a lot to go through. And for this, I'm recommending the viewers to take notes during this episode. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, the OEM upgrade approach we're gonna talk about today needs a few tests at the beginning. We're gonna offer you a solution to each situation that you would find. So to be practical, when a customer comes in for an audio upgrade, how do you decide what to do? Well. I want to know two things before I design a system for a customer. And the first one is, what will make the customer happy? And that's a good point. We need to know what's going to make the customer happy before we design that system. And we might think there's an infinite number of ways to make different customers happy, but I just work off of this basic list. So the, on this list, the first thing is a subwoofer. A subwoofer is the simplest upgrade. And many customers just want more bass than the factory system has. Yes, and I know Odison has a lot of subwoofer products. Yes, absolutely. Now, some customers just want a louder full range system. And they're okay with what they already have. They just want it louder. And because of what I like to call the law of excursion, louder often means you still need to add a subwoofer but often louder doesn't require you to use a DSP. However, if you're upgrading the sound, it shouldn't sound worse than where they started. Yeah, right. And that's one of the reason the SR amplifiers have USS speaker loading and advanced crossover filtering. Is that because we know that customers use those functions sometimes without the DSP. Right. So maybe they want a louder full range system that has great sound. Now, some customers are not concerned with stereo imaging, but they may be very concerned with what I call tonality, the sound of the system. Yeah. In my professional opinion, you don't wanna take responsibility for the sound of the system if you don't have a DSP processor in it. Yeah, our bit processor lets you manage your frequency response, whether or not you're trying to deliver stereo imaging. As you move up the line of bit processor, we give you more tools, not just more channels. Now, what about a louder full range system that sounds great and has stereo for the driver? This is the big one. This is the one that many of us hold up as the holy grail of car audio. And for many years, we had to rebuild the car interior and use modified pro audio gear to get that one seat stereo. Nowadays, we can do that with factory speaker locations as long as we use DSP properly. Now, when many of us learned how to use DSP, we were taught that one seat stereo was always our goal. But here on the list, we've got a louder full range system that sounds great and it has stereo for both front seats. And we mentioned in the first episode, we talk about this one because the OEMs are using many different techniques to deliver this that we need to take into account. Uh, some of the ways the OEMs do this can really interfere with our upgrades. So that's the first list, what we can offer our customers. Now, there's obviously many different levels of performance for each of these and many different levels of budget for each of these. And I think most specialists are good at deciding what will make their customer happy. That's basically what they do every day. Yes, many of us are good at that. Now, some of the items on that list might have been new for some of us. I know that some of them were new for me at one point. Now, 
In system design, we should also think about number two, what the OEM system is doing to the sound. When we know what the OEM system is doing to the sound, then we know what we can do and how hard or how easy it's gonna to be to accomplish that. Now, we're gonna show a list. The first part of this list, we've been dealing with these OEM processing aspects for years. And remember, we can't test for any of this stuff until we get the car apart and we test the wires. So what is the OEM system doing to the sound? We know that there's often equalization in the system. And we talked about that in the first episode and how Audison corrects it. Oh, we we talked about how sometimes it's dynamic equalization. Yes. And we talked about how Audison products correct that. We talked about how there's active crossovers in a lot of modern systems. And we talked about how you can use bit processors to correct that. We talked about muting the outputs. A lot of factory speaker systems will mute the outputs. And we talked about how USS speaker simulators correct that. Now, we also mentioned high voltage signals. Oh, we didn't talk about this one much. No, we didn't explain it last in the previous episode. Mm -hmm. um, most OEM signals for a very long time maxed out at about eight volts of AC, and that was it. So it was pretty simple for all of the passive line output converters and all of the speaker level inputs to handle this eight volts of AC. Then some car companies started using more powerful amps in some of the premium systems. The most common car company that uses this kind of amp is BMW but there are others. And these can actually reach 35 volts AC. Wow. Then this is almost always on the base channels, by the way. So if you come across one of these cars, a high voltage line output the converter on those channels is very important. That will keep the sound clean and not damage your equipment. This is why Electromedia has the SLI 2.2 in the connection line. Okay. So this is the list of things that we need to know before we wire up and install our product. But none of these things affect our overall system design and none of them affect the sound when we're finished if we have addressed each one properly when we install the system. And we talk in episode one about bit products and peripherals solving all those issues. Absolutely. Your company has introduced a lot of products to help technicians solve each of these problems but I'm sure you can't know all the answers without testing the wires. Yes, you have to test the wires to confirm what you're expecting to find because sometimes you might need to change the plan. You might need more channels. You might need to load the speaker outputs. You might need to handle higher voltage. And if you're gonna make this kind of change to the system design, it's really important to do it early as soon as you take the car apart. Any changes need to happen at the beginning of the project not at the end of the project, because last minute changes are just not good business. All right. So I have been emphasizing for years, we always need to test the wires, but it's not what we should do first. What do you do first? Well, remember our discussion of stereo presentations in the previous episode? Well, right. here's a list of all the stereo presentations that they might use. There's stereo, one seat with stereo with delay, there could be a mono center. There could be a mono center mid-range system. They could have an upmixed center speaker. They could use two seat phase equalization. Now that's a pretty short list. So let's take the list of solutions, the subwoofer, louder system, louder with great sound, with stereo for the driver or stereo for both front seats. Let's take the list of OEM approaches and remember what we want is a successful plan. We want to see where they overlap. So you can see here, if you take, you wanna plan a system that fits the car and it also fits the customer. That's right. And here we go. There you go. So tell us so, how you do this. I use a three-part process. Stop, right. look, listen. Right. And I say stop because many specialists in our industry are very hardworking and they'll take the car apart before they do any listening tests. And it's hard to listen to the OEM system when everything is disconnected. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so the next step is look. So 
it's kind of obvious, you're going to look for speaker grills and you're going to count them. And this gives us a good idea of how many speakers there are in the system. Sometimes there are two speakers under one grill. Sometimes there's hidden woofers. They might be in the console or the firewall or under the seats. But this is a really good start. And in this graph, you see, uh, this picture you see here, there are 13 speaker grills. Two of them are really hard to see. And the rear deck speaker grills and the center channel speaker grills do end up having two drivers underneath each grill. Now, these two here under the seats would be really difficult to see. But when you play the, a test tone, you'd be able to hear the sub bass come out of there if you played a sub bass test tone. Now, you're also going to want to look for badges or brand names on the speaker grills or on the radio. And this is really important later because you're going to need to know at some point if you're working with the base audio package or one of the premium sound packages. Right. Now, you should look to see if there is a center speaker. And this will also be important later. And you should look in the menu for the OEM head unit to see if there are any audio adjustments. And in this picture here, this is the menu from my BMW iDrive. And you can see there's a Logic 7 on off button in the tone control menu. Finally, you're gonna wanna look at the rear headliner for ANC microphone grills. They are not always obvious, but here's a picture of a Honda Pilot ANC grill about halfway back in the headliner. So that's the entire list. And it doesn't take long to get in a car and look around and see all these things. Now you should also look up the car online. And the first thing that I do, oddly enough, is I will look it up on Google. Yes. And if you Google Bose Corvette 2018, for example, you get this beautiful picture that shows you where all the speaker are in the car, where the amplifier is in the car, what size they are. And this is true for a lot of branded systems, Bose, Harman Kardon, or Meridian. You'd be surprised how often you find a picture just like this. Uh, you should also look up the car in your service information system. And in North America, that's going to be pro demand or all data. And they offer repair shops information and it includes wiring diagrams. And here's an example. This shows a Honda Civic base model audio with six speakers that are all wired directly to the radio. Now, you also want to look in configurator or application guides for the car. And the example I'm going to show you here is on the Audison website. If you're working with a BMW 3 Series and you want to know if the bit DMI covers that year, you can look it up on the Audison website and find out that it does cover uh, the years of E91 or E90 sedan. So oddly enough, you can also look in Facebook groups. Uh, the Educar integration group on Facebook has a lot of application information in it about different cars. And it's a really great resource for professionals. So at this here point, you go. yeah, what do you know? So let's make a list of what we know. We know the estimated number of speakers. Yep. We know if there's an amplifier and we probably know where it is in the car. We know the number of output channels the system right. has. We know if there's a center speaker. Right. And we know if there is an up mixing on off button or a listening position button in the menu of the radio. And we know if there are ANC microphones, either because we saw them in the headliner or we saw them on the wiring diagram. So, so now, that's a lot. That's a really important list to have if you're designing an audio system, especially if you're trying to figure out how much time to charge for. But we're not quite done. Now we need to listen. Wow. And what does that tell us? The biggest thing that you can learn from listening is which stereo presentation type the OEM system is using. And thankfully, this is really simple, as long as you use proper test tones instead of listening to music. This is also when you can find out if there are hidden speakers like those console subs or under seat subwoofers or firewall speakers. Uh, we can test to see if a center speaker is the only speaker playing hands-free or playing navigation prompts or playing chimes. And if it is, we may need to keep it in the system. And finally, we might notice any problems with the OEM system in that particular car that might cause us problems later, like a bad channel. What kinds of stereo presentation are there again, please? Well, here's that list. 
Oh, and what is the asterisk for? Well, those three use center speakers and the other three don't use center speakers. I'm going to the video, Matt. I see, okay. Um, why are we concerned about what the OEM is doing if the customer isn't concerned about stereo performance? Because we don't want to make it worse. Hmm. By using certain techniques in the wrong situation, we could leave out all the mid-range or we could leave out all the vocals or we could end up with a horrible frequency response. Okay, can you explain this to our audience? I'm happy to. And of course, we're going to start with stereo, where the center information is common to both channels. We used to just assume that everything was stereo. Um, it's not the case anymore. It doesn't matter, by the way, if they used equalization or what kind of equalization it is, or if there are active crossovers, those don't change stereo into anything else. It's still stereo. So if you are going to test this car, and you sat in either front seat and you played a mid bass pink noise track. It's not in the center of the car. It's confused and kind of split apart. Now, if you were to move your head over into the middle of the car and put it between the seats and look forward, then the mid bass would sound like it's in the middle of the windshield. And stereo is still the most likely thing we're going to find. Many OEMs still use stereo. Now, here's a picture of stereo with delay, where the center information is in both channels, but one channel gets delayed internally. And this is really rare as an OEM technique. Uh, we use it all the time. We often call it time alignment, but the OEMs don't use it all the time. I haven't actually tested a car that has one seat delay that you can't just turn off. So I don't have a good example for you. But if it's present, it's usually a setting in the tone control menu that you can turn on and off. The bit virtuoso corrects for delay, for instance. That's right, it does. So if you do find a car like that, the bit virtuoso will solve that problem. Sure. Now, when you see a center speaker, as I mentioned before, it's being used in one of three ways. And we need to know which one of the three ways it is. And the first one is mono center speaker, wow. where all information that left and right are both present, but all information also gets routed to the center channel. And with those, the left and the right speakers are normal stereo. Now, if I were going to test a BMW that didn't have Logic 7, we can do a couple of easy listening tests. And the first one is, let's play a right channel test tone. It's gonna come out the right side, but it will also come out the center. Now, when you play a left channel test tone, it will come out the left side, but it will also come out the center. So if you play a mono test tone, it'll come out of all, front, all the front speakers, the left, the right, and the center. Now, as long as the left and the right speakers are also playing hands-free audio, and they're also playing chime information, you can just unplug that center speaker, and that's usually how it is. And boom, now it's stereo. That works. Yeah. Now, sometimes you have to load that center speaker to prevent muting issues with the factory amplifier or to prevent any trouble codes, but that's really it. Yeah, that sounds simple. What if the mono center speaker plays all the tones and all the sounds? Well, if it does play the hands-free and it plays the, the chimes, the best thing to do is use an external preamp. But the second best solution is to test to see if the rear speakers have stereo. And if they have stereo, you can usually fade the fader all the way to the rear and use the rear speaker signal for your front speaker upgrade. And the OEM center speaker won't play music anymore, but it will still play those really important non-entertainment sounds, even with the fader all the way to the rear. Now, mono center speaker systems are in a lot of cars. A slightly different system with a center speaker is what I call mono center mid-range. And with this one, all the mid-range information goes to the center channel. And this presentation mode is pretty rare. I've only found it so far in certain Toyota and Subaru cars in the Harman Kardon and the JBL sound packages. Now here's a Subaru Outback. And in this one, you can see there are left and right door woofers. There are left and right dash wideband speakers. And there is also a center speaker. 
And if you play a bass test tone, it comes out of both door woofers. Okay. If you play a treble test tone, it comes out of both dash speakers. Okay. But if you play a mid-range test tone, and it doesn't matter whether it's a left channel or a right channel or both, it always comes out that center speaker. What? This, this system plays all the mid-range from the center, regardless of the stereo location in the recording. It changes it all to mono. And in the cars I've tested, that mono range is between 200 and 2,000 hertz. So that isn't stereo at all. You're absolutely correct. That is not stereo at all. And we can't even get stereo out of this system in any of the traditional ways. What we do then? Well, you got three options. Number one is use an external preamp. And at least one of the cars with mono center mid-range, which is the Toyota Highlander third generation with JBL, that car is supported by Maestro AR, so you can get perfect stereo signal out with a Maestro AR. That's good. Yeah, that's, that's a lifesaver. Now, the 2020 Subaru Outback with JBL, that one doesn't have external preamp support yet. Um, Harman Kardon is a big company. They may have used this system in other cars that I just haven't tested yet. So your options at that point depend on what does the customer want? If they want stereo, you're going to have to use an external reference digital audio player as a source. Yeah, and that's an important part of the Audison approach. The combination of a DRC and a CTO allow your customer to change from OEM system to their digital audio player easily with no loss of fidelity. Right, and that works great. Now, if your client doesn't care about stereo, maybe they just want it louder, then you can amplify the signal that the factory system is using. You can make it louder and you can make it sonically pleasing if you use good speakers and you use good setup but it won't ever be stereo. Well, stereo is very important to me, but I guess not all customers want stereo. This is true. And that is something we should be learning about our customers as part of the sales process, right? Now let's go back to center speakers. Okay. Um, the third option is that that center speaker might be up mixed. Mm. And in that situation, any common information that's in both channels is routed to the center channel. So sounds on the left or the right only will not go to the center channel. So let's look at that BMW again. And if you see a badge or a menu item anywhere in the car, it could say Dolby ProLogic 2. It could say DTS. It could say ELS. It could say Logic 7, or it could say center point. Those are all various kinds of up mixer. And we're gonna talk about the Harman Kardon system that came in my BMW. And there is a center speaker and we're going to turn logic seven on for this test. Now you play a left channel test tone. It comes out of the left speaker and not the center speaker. If you play a right channel test tone, it comes out the right speaker, but not the center speaker. That's your tip that that is an up mixer. Now, when you play a mono test tone, it'll come out of the center of the dash roughly. It's often not perfectly centered. And that is because the factory system often doesn't drive that center channel as loud as I think it should be. So if you have an up mix system and you can turn it off, like with my BMW, you have to decide, do you want to retain it or not? And if you turn it off, most up mix systems will revert back to a mono center channel if you've got the switch turned off. So we can disconnect the center speaker. Yes, exactly. Now, something to know about upmixing is that it's supposed to improve imperfect listening rooms as well as imperfect listening positions. And one of the ways they do this is they use two sets of rear speakers. And one set plays an ambiance signal to create the sense of a larger room than the inside of the car. And this is important for us to know because few DSP processors on the market support two sets of rear speakers. Yeah, and let me say that with Bit Virtuoso, you can pass that through. Here is an example from the software showing two sets of rear passing through. By the way, what do they do to make the room feel bigger? Well, it's often some variation on this left minus right signal, and it deletes any content that is shared between the two channels. 
And that means that the sounds from the center of the stage are not played by those ambient speakers behind us. And then they'll often add some amount of delay to emulate the reflections in a larger room. Now, once you take all that into account, the result that you can get when you properly upgrade a quality upmix system is a wide stereo stage and then a center image that's clear from either front seat. If you have an upmix system that you can't turn off, the only way you can get rid of it is if you use an external preamp. And that defeats the upmixing? Yes. The upmixing from two channel to multi channel almost always happens in the OEM amplifier. So taking the amplifier out of the signal path with an external preamp, is that delete the processing? Yes. So with the cars that have an external preamp available, you will get good, clean two-channel stereo. Thing is, not all cars are supported. So what do we do then? OK, so the car has multi-channel upmixing. There's no external preamp. Our best plan is to retain the upmixing. This is also what you do if there is an external preamp option available, but you want to retain the upmixer. If you want to retain the upmixer, do not use the external preamp. So at that point, we need to go back to the question, what's going to make our customer happy? If your customer is a huge two-channel enthusiast and they're totally committed to that one-seat stereo presentation, you're going to have to go with a reference source that isn't the OEM system. Yeah, and right. We talked about that earlier, and that works beautifully for those clients. So now let's talk about a different customer. They okay. want better sound from the OEM system. They're not interested in another source, and they have no problem with the idea of multi-channel sound. And, and I have to confess, for many years, I was really biased against multi-channel sound. I didn't understand what it was trying to do. I didn't know how to get great results with it. And so I would joke that it was just for movies. <laughs> so recently I rented a 2019 Cadillac ATS. And whenever I rent a car, I use this process to evaluate the system in the car. Okay, okay. That's just a stop, look, and listen, right? Right, good job. <laughs> so I saw Bose badges. I saw a center speaker. I saw front and rear door speakers. And then I saw a sub big subwoofer grill in the rear deck. And in the tone control menu, it just had bass and treble. There was nothing for me to turn on or off. And there were ANC microphone grills when I looked up at the headliner. So the wiring diagram showed ANC microphones also. Uh, it showed that the car used a most 50 digital network for the amplifier. And the amplifier had eight channels, front, left, and right, rear, left, and right, center, subwoofer, and then there were two rear deck effects channels. So what do we do now? Well, here's what we know, that whole list. We have an estimate of the number of speakers. There are 10. We know there's an amplifier with eight channels. We know there's a center speaker that is up mixed. We know that we can't turn off the up mixing. And we know we have to budget time for ANC microphone defeat. So. It turned out that there were 10 speakers because the rear surround speakers were underneath the subwoofer grill. Mm -hmm. And we learned a lot of important things to design this system. And we learned it all without taking the car apart. And we're going to use this information again later in this episode. So let's go on to the two seat with phase equalization. Now, this one can be the most confusing. <laughs> because with phase equalization, the OEM system will put certain defined frequency ranges out of phase with the rest. And why do they do that? Well, we're going to start by talking about how stereo works to explain why they do that. Remember, you got two speakers, you sit in between them, you connect them in proper polarity, of course. But if you sit closer to one speaker than to the other speaker, those unequal distances put the left and the right speakers out of phase with each other at certain specific and predictable frequencies, which you can see here in this example graph. And that's what we correct with bit processor with their time alignment setting. Yes, exactly. It turns out that time alignment or delay will only work for one unique listening position. And that's why OEM automakers often don't use it because they prefer similar sound in both front seats. And what kind of problems this uh, 
creates for us. Many OEM systems have an amplifier. Those amplifiers may often have dedicated channels for dash wideband speakers and for door woofers. I'm gonna show you one example. This is a Bose system uh, with a setup like that. They're using active crossovers in the amplifier? Yes, often they are. And that crossover you see in that graph, it's several octaves lower than a tweeter crossover would be. We cannot use that crossover point for a tweeter. We would blow it up. So for years, what we have done is to sum these channels back together to full range. And then we'll replace the OEM speakers with a nice normal 165 millimeter, six and a half, and a tweeter component set. And we'll put use a new higher crossover point for our two-way component set. And what's wrong with that? Well, you can see in this chart that if those two channels are not in phase with each other at all frequencies, you get a lot of cancellations and you get this roller coaster response. The signal's a mess. You mentioned that in the last episode, isn't it? Yeah, so remember when the speakers are not the same distance apart, the sounds are not in phase with each other at every frequency, right? Here's the chart showing you that comb filtering effect again. And that problem affects both front seats. So I used to think that we use delay to correct these perceived arrival times. I was mistaken. The arrival times are too close together for humans to perceive them as arriving at different times. Uh, but we do still hear these cancellations. The cancellations are what we hear, not the arrival times, yes. Okay, so our approach in the aftermarket for ears has been to delay the various speakers so they are arriving at the same time. And so they are all in phase at the driver's seat. Yes, and that sounds great when we're done if the left and the right speakers were, or signals were in phase with each other when we started. Now, if the OEM has already put some notes out of phase to partially address this problem themselves, our delay settings will not do what we want them to do. And that, is phase equalization. And by the way, I really love this diagram. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> now, if we miss the presence of phase equalization and the left and the right signals are not in phase with each other at every frequency, our delay settings will not work. They, not, there won't be any proper setting to put the distances to, to make it work for us. And we might even start to tell ourselves that tape measures must not work for setting delay. And you mentioned a few ways to handle this in the first episode. Yeah, there are a few different ways to handle it. But first, we need to know if it's being used. And the best way to know is to listen. Mm. I play a mono mid-bass pink noise track. And I have that track on my Educar Test Home smartphone app. And then I listen from either front seat. And for instance, in this Toyota Tacoma, if you sit in either front seat because of the phase EQ, you will hear the mid-bass roughly in the middle of the windshield. But if you lean over and you put your head in between the front seats in the center, and then you're going to hear the mid-bass sort of split apart. You'd also hear that in this 2018 Chevy Silverado with bows. That means there's phase EQ. Okay, why do you use mid-bass for this test? Well, that's a really good question. And it's because the single biggest sonic issue that is caused by the third problem of car stereo if you have door speakers, is the cancellation around 200 to 250 hertz. And the exact frequency depends on how wide the car is. So I'm gonna put up this chart here, and this is the simplest use of phase equalization. Um, I, this is an actual measurement, and I took it in a simulated car cabin with no reflections and with imaginary door speakers that were playing full range. And you can see the biggest problem is in the mid bass. And we're going to show you how we would take an all-pass filter and use one all-pass filter on one channel right on top of that cancellation point. Now you can see the cancellation is gone at either front seat. We didn't affect any of the other problems, but we fixed the problem at 250 hertz. And the cancellation, boom, it's gone. So. This may be the only problem they solve using phase equalization. In the 2018 Toyota Tacoma or the 2018 Subaru Outback that I did, that's a big use of phase equalization. And so that's why I call it simple phase equalization.
Now, complex phase equalization might use a lot of all-pass filters to address many different problems. And that can be difficult to correct. If you're looking for one seat stereo, if you've got complex phase equalization, an external preamp is the fastest way for you to go if you can get one. So let's say you test a car and there is a phase EQ. What do you do then? Well, I make a note and then I keep going through the sales process of asking myself what will make this customer happy. Okay, now that you have given us example, let's explain how to do this. Okay. So here's the list of different stereo presentations we talked about before. And here's the list of different op things we can do for our customers. So remember our goal, the successful plan. So here's both lists together. We're gonna look at both lists together for a moment. And we're gonna start with adding a subwoofer. And it turns out that you can add a subwoofer to any of these stereo presentation modes and it's not a problem. You might have to have uh, ANC microphone feedback problems to fix. You might have high voltage signals to handle, but the stereo presentation mode does not matter. It won't affect adding a subwoofer. Okay. Uh, well, this one has an APBX power subwoofer for adding subs. And uh, you can also use a Prima AP1D and the APBX 10D subwoofer. For a higher output system, you can use the SR1500 and APS-10S4S in a custom enclosure. And if you have a car with high voltage on the sub-channel, you might need to add an SLI 2.2. All right, that's a lot of different options if you're adding subwoofers, but the sub adding a subwoofer is very simple. Yeah. With the full range systems, we're going to need to be more careful. Sure. So let's say we're starting with stereo. So we can add a subwoofer. We can deliver a louder system. We can deliver a better sounding system. We can deliver a better sounding system that is optimized for the driver's seat. But this car doesn't have a two seat presentation in it. So we don't have to worry about retaining it. And because this course is about OEM integration, I'm not gonna go into adding two seat other than to say there's not a lot of equipment available to do it well today. Now, same thing if you're starting with one seat with delay. If you found a rare system that has OEM delay in it, you can correct it or you can, you can use it or you can correct it using a bit virtuoso. But we didn't start with a two seat presentation, so there's nothing to retain. Now, a mono center. If you have a mono center, you can add a subwoofer, you can add a louder full range system, you can add a louder full range system with great sound, and you can do stereo for the driver as long as you can unplug that mono center. Mono if, it, if you can't unplug it, you can use the rear stereo channels, fade it to the rear, or if you can get one, you can use an external preamp. But you don't have two seat technology from the factory, so there's nothing to retain here. Okay, now, uh... You don't consider a mono center speaker to be a two seat stereo? No, I really don't. When you have the same sound coming from two speakers at the same time, you have a really tough time getting stereo out of it. So I don't consider that a two seat stereo technology. Hmm. Now let's talk about mono center mid range for a minute. Now, once again, with this system, we can add a subwoofer and we can upgrade to a louder system and we can upgrade to a louder system that has better sound. All those options are available to us, but stereo is not available to us. And we cannot get stereo for the driver or for both front seats because it's not in the system. We're either gonna need to use an external preamp or we're gonna need to use a second source like a digital audio player. And once again, it's not a two seat stereo presentation. There's nothing for us to retain. Yeah. But what about up mixed multi-channel? Now, once again, we can add a sub, we can make it louder, and we can make it louder with great sound, but we better keep that center speaker. Many of us have had experiences trying to upgrade one of these systems without keeping the center speaker and it doesn't go well. You are gonna have disappointing results. But stereo for the driver is not available if the up mixer isn't defeatable. If you don't have an on off button, you will not get a driver oriented stereo presentation out of this car. Now, 
you can go for two seat stereo sound. And that's gonna require you to use a few more amp channels, a few more DSP channels, and a few more speakers. Let's go back to that Cadillac for, for, as an example. So here's a list of the eight channels. Remember, there's two sets of rear speakers here. Yeah, and we could use a bit virtuoso in pass-through mode and support all those channels and two sets of rears. Yes, that would be the perfect way to go, absolutely. But I can give you another option. And the other option, I leave the rear door speakers on the OEM amplifier using OEM power. Not upgrade the rears? Well, you could upgrade them with an efficient speaker like a Prima coaxial, but the goal here is to eliminate two input channels from the system. So you see here, if we cross off the rear doors, we don't have eight channels to deal with anymore. We only have six. And we don't have to process and amplify two sets of rears anymore. We only have to process and amplify one set of rears. So a bit Nova would be great. Yes, we can bring in the six channels and we can design a few systems. In this system, I used a SR5 channel and SR4 channel to power everything. And you also need to disconnect the ANC microphones when you go this route. Yeah. Okay. And if another works, then a Prima DSP amplifier, such as an 8.9 bit or a Forza 8.9 also works. The Nove and the Prima family all use the same DSP core. Yes, certainly. So then we just need to decide on the amplifiers and speakers we want to use. Now, I like the idea of using an APK 165P component set in the front doors. And then I would put an AP2 in the 80 millimeter center speaker spot and whatever subwoofer I think the customer would like in the trunk. And we could upgrade the rear doors to the Prima coaxes, or we could leave them stock. Um, you can also leave the 60 millimeter rear effect speaker stock. You could replace them with AP2s if you want, but if they're in good condition, I often leave them stock. And this right here is a great example of a simple up mixer system upgrade. No, oh. you remember when two amps and eight channels are considered a complex audio system? <laughs> I do remember those days, yes. But if we had simply unplugged the center channel and tried to make that system work, we would have had a very difficult time because all the sound from the center of the stage would have just disappeared. Okay, so now let me how hard is to tune these systems. You know, at first I was really intimidated by the idea of tuning one of these systems because it was different than what I usually had done. It turns out to be much simpler than I expected. Now, in my experience, customers prefer the center of the stereo stage to be the center of the vehicle. That is my preference as well. So to get that, we're often gonna to need to drive the center speaker with a little more energy than the OEM system uses. We don't wanna to use too much because we will then lose all the stage width. So it's simply the output level control in the bit processor software? Yes. Once you've upgraded and you have more power than the OEM system, you just need to control it without level control. And you can still get stereo if you use an external preamp or you can use a second source. Such as in a digital audio player. Yes, exactly. So on the list here, with two seat phase EQ, we can add a subwoofer, we can get a louder full range system, we can get a louder full range system with great sound as long as we don't sum channels together. Now, you can use an external preamp or a bit virtuoso and use the dephase feature. And that's why this one's yellow rather than red, because it's a lot more work to, to solve on some cars than in other cars. So let's talk about two different vehicles that have two seat phase equalization. And first, let's talk about a 2018 Subaru Outback with bass audio. Sounds like you've done one. Yeah, I have. It was the first car I found with phase equalization in it. And it has the door woofers and the dash widebander locations like a lot of cars, but it's a non-amplified four channel system. And it has just basic phase equalization. There's one all pass filter at 250 Hertz on one channel. Okay. Subaru. There you go. So all the phase EQ does is improving the response in the 250 Hertz region and both front seats? Yes, that is exactly right. 
So it turns out this car is pretty simple to get one seat stereo out of. How so? Well, you remember the three problems of car stereo. I mentioned those in the first episode. So first off, we're going to plan on using a door woofer. An AP690 would work great as an example. And then we're going to install an AP2 in the dash. And that speaker system combination lets us use a crossover point that's around 500 hertz. Why do we want to do that? Well, remember this graph that showed the cancellations being caused by the path length differences of door speakers? So if we restrict the door woofer to the range below 500 hertz, there is only one cancellation that speaker will have to play in the pass band for that signal. At 250 hertz. Yes. So the first problem of car stereo is that one side is louder. And we fix that in the bit processor with the level controls. The second problem of car stereo is that one side sounds different from the other. So we can EQ the two door speakers differently so they have the same response. And we solve the second problem. Now for the third problem, remember, we don't really care about the arrival times. What we care about are the phase cancellations. So that means that the OEM system has already fixed the third problem of car stereo for us. Yes, exactly. They've put an all-pass filter at 250 hertz. And so this problem at 250 hertz has always been already been corrected by the factory phase equalization. You can see it here in this chart. So the next cancellation would be around 750 hertz. We aren't letting the door speaker play that high. So now let's look at the AP2. There's a bunch of cancellations that would affect the AP2, but now we set up the AP2 to play only 500 Hertz and up. And then we match the levels again using the bit processor. We match the responses again using the equalizers in the bit processor. But this time we use delay the way we normally would. And now that's what we get. And now there are no more cancellation above 500. Not for the driver, correct. Now in real life, there's a few cancellations still from reflections inside the car, but we have solved the third problem of car stereo using the OEM phase EQ on the mid bass speakers and using our time alignment settings on the mid range speakers. And this is what we have. And you can think of this system as being driver optimized above 500 Hertz and two seat optimized below 500 Hertz the vocals will be improved in both seats, for example. But doesn't delay also affect the transition band between the two speakers? Yes, it does to a degree. And so I recommend you measure the distance to the passenger door woofer, and then you enter that value into both door woofer channels. And then there's still a small trade-off, but it is a huge improvement. So we can do a car with the basic phase EQ without a virtuoso. We can use a B10, an AP bit, an over, and bias it for the driver's seat. Yes, you can if you use an AP2 or a three-way speaker set. If you use a six and a tweeter two-way speaker set, we cannot pull this off. The crossover in that situation is way too high, and we end up with a cancellation at 750 hertz being played by the door woofer, and probably another one around 2200. It's right around the crossover point to the tweeter in a lot of systems. Okay, now I understand. You want to de detect the phase equalization early, so you know what kind of speaker system you need to use. That's exactly right. This AP2 speaker is really useful in these kind of situations. If that's the simple phase EQ, what's the complicated phase EQ? Well, it usually says Bose on it. <laughs> so Bose uses a lot of phase equalization, especially in systems without a center speaker. And that is complicated enough that I expect undoing it all would be a manual process using a bit virtuoso and some decent amount of time. Uh, the thing is, that system already has some center image already. It is not as pinpoint as we like because Bose values spaciousness over pinpoint imaging. But they've already spent some time using phase equalization to address these cancellation problems. So let's say you test the car and there is phase EQ. What do you do then? Well, again, I make a note and I keep going through my sales process of what's going to make this customer happy. 
Some customers don't care about stereo. Some customers kind of like stereo, but some customers love stereo. So if you have a customer who is happy with the OEM stereo presentation, they just want more output and they just want more bass, you can amplify the OEM system signals without summing them. Okay. Now this seems like a good time for another example. All right. Let's look at a 2014 and up Chevy Silverado with Bose. Uh, there are a lot of these trucks in North America. And this system has a two-way active front stage with dash wideband speakers and door woofers. And then there are rear door speakers and there's often a subwoofer, but not always. And you can see this chart, it's kind of an approximation of the frequency signal that's sent to the door woofers and sent to the dash speakers. And because of the phase equalization, remember if you sum these channels back together, you get a big cancellation. I remember this. So we're not gonna sum. We're gonna leave delay out of it. We're just gonna let the OEM processing handle it. So here's the neat trick that I recommend. We're going to connect the front dash channels to the front inputs of the SR5 channel amplifier. And we're gonna connect the front door woofer channels to the rear inputs of the SR5 channel amplifier. If there's a subwoofer, we're gonna connect that input to the subwoofer signal. So then we use AP2 speakers in the dash, we use AP690 speakers in the doors, and we select whatever subwoofer solution is gonna work for the customer. We don't set the crossovers in the amplifier unless your truck doesn't have the factory subwoofer, and then you're gonna use the factory or the, the subwoofer setting in the SR amplifier. I see, and what if they also want a great sound? Well, then we need equalization. So it's time for a bit processor, right? Yes, but we're still going to use the same trick. Yeah. We're gonna connect the dash signal to the front inputs, and then we're gonna connect the door signal to the rear inputs like this. Now, once your customer is looking for great sound, even if they don't care about stereo, the best way to get there is to use the power of DSP, right? Yeah. Okay, but you can also use a Forza. Yes, and we're still using the same trick when we use a Forza. Dash signal to the front inputs, door signal into the rear inputs. And we also still use the AP2 and an AP690 so we can use the OEM crossover points. Now, we have a choice to make. We can leave it optimized for both front seats. And if we're gonna do that, we leave the left and right equalization and the left and the right levels locked together or we can bias it towards the driver by using different level settings and different equalization settings for left and right. But either way, we do not use delay at all. We just let the OEM phase equalization address the cancellations for us. We can also use the bit Nove in the same way. In, in this system, I've paired it with an AV 5.1K. Not bad. So there happen to be two ways that you could use the bit Virtuoso. First, you can set it in pass-through mode and use the AP2 and the AP690, but this also lets you upgrade the rear speakers. You could also use the de-phase process and get one seat stereo after you've put everything back into phase. And then you can use the highest performance speakers. Yes, absolutely. Okay, I was a lot. Now can we test the wires? Yes, now that we have a good plan, we can test the wires. Now, I'm afraid we are out of time. Let's go over this in the next episode. So we hope you enjoyed the second episode, dear guest. We have covered much information and we know many of you must have questions. Please do it here live, activating the Q&A function as shown in the next image. We are all here, here for you. Okay, um, um, there's uh, Mr. Luca at Logic and it says that if it's possible, se è possibile in Italian, um, guardare il primo episodio domani. Sì, Luca, e, e nel link di registrazione puoi trovare il primo episodio. So Fabian Cajas, you reply to this guy? I read, the, I read the question. If we know that energy is dissipated in heat, 
what are the recommendations to obtain a lower temperature operation? And what would be ideal temperature when operating the amplifiers and Odysseus processor? Do you have um, any? The one thing that I suggest to people is to remember how uh, heat sinks work. And so if you take certain amplifiers and you put them upside down or you put them in the wrong position, then you're going to have uh, convection will not work for you. So, oh, yeah. Let's see here. There we go. What about using PAC AP4 interfaces? I don't know what PAC stands for. Um, I, I'm familiar with them. They're an, another supplier of interfaces and if you have a company that makes a, a external preamp for the car um, and you, that's what works for your customer, then I think they work fine. Um, so, you know, you, the important thing is to make sure you know what's going to make the customer happy before you decide whether or not you're going to use one. But yes, I, I, I think that's fine. Okay, then we have Hiken. In a high quality four way active system, what frequencies do you recommend for the three crossover point as a start? Ah, uh, you're going to love my answer. It depends. Um, <laughs> and it depends on the speakers that you're using. And what I mean by that is that if you are working with a less costly speaker, or you're working with a more expensive, higher performance speaker, the mechanical characteristics are different. So if you look at what the crossover frequency is in a Voce system for the tweeter, for example, that is around 2,500 hertz. But if you look at the crossover frequency for a Prima system, it is higher. So it really depends on the speakers that you're using as where you would select a place to start. Um, if you're using a three-way system, then I would it would depend on the size of your mid-range and uh, the, the mechanical resonance of the mid-range. So I, I wish I had a, a rule of thumb for every speaker, but that's where I would start. Thanks, Tim. And the uh, next one, Paul Ellis. Great second training session, guys. Can wait for the next in the series. Thank you from the guys at Source Sounds UK. Thank you. Hi, UK. Thank you. Very appreciated. See you in two weeks' time. So Jan has a question about how do you set an all-pass filter in the software? And the all-pass filter in the Bit Virtuoso software, we're actually going to have an episode in a couple of weeks that is all about the Virtuoso. And we're gonna show you exactly how to set the all-pass filter in that software. So I think we are quite done. We can go to the next slide and... Uh... Oh yeah. Yeah, we are done. So for those of you who are too shy to show up or that uh, didn't have the time to to make a question or if you're going to be going to your shop and then applying some of the technique and still want to know something, you can contact us anytime and support at electromedia.it and uh, we will be replying to your questions uh, in the next episode or uh, on an email. Okay. So um, we did yes. have one last question from Marco yes, yes. asking about how do you count yes. the output channel? Sure, sure. It was in the chat. Oh, and yeah. Yeah. Um, basically the way that you can count the output channels before you take out the car is by looking at the wiring diagram. If you don't have access to the wiring diagram, then the only way to be certain is to get access to the factory amplifier and test with your analyzer to see what frequencies are on different channels to see how many channels you will need. And that's why it's much, it's very helpful to be able to look it up online before you start. Okay. So yes, again. So let's summer briefly what's going to be like in the next episode. The title is going to be Fast and Affecting, the Sound Pack Concept. And we're going to be talking about car-specific components and their use. Plug and play wirings. That's a very important part of the process for the sound pack. 
sound packs and how to choose them. So also part of how to do it and the configuration files for one-stop tuning. Of course, we're gonna be also talking about speakers, how to choose them in particular conditions. Uh, and I think that's all for today. And I would like to thank all of the attendees for being with us. Let's keep in contact. See you in two weeks' times. Okay. See you in two weeks. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.